Very good. Well, uh, I know we have an audience around the world, so good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'll give you a, an overview of the, the main aspects of ASHRAE's guidance that relate to, uh, to ventilation specifically, given the, the topic of this uh, webinar. So let's, let's start, uh, although it's already been stated, by reviewing some of the uh, fundamentals about COVID-19 transmission that uh, underlie the development of, of guidance. Uh, the, the first is that uh, uh, ASHRAE, uh, like REVA, has since the spring uh, recognized the potential for airborne transmission. Uh, we, we've also seen that uh, there are super spreader events that have occurred uh, either with actually verified or with suspected uh, low outdoor air exchange rates, so ventilation is important. Um, there's evidence of impact on uh, in-room transmission due to air currents when outdoor air exchange is, is inadequate, but there isn't really any uh, strong evidence for room-to-room -room transmission, particularly in the types of systems that are, are common uh, in, in North America. So the, uh, the scope of ASHRAE guidance is um, uh, quite a bit broader in, in a number of ways than REVA's guidance. It's not specific to, uh, to North America, and it's not specific to a, a narrow set of, of building types. So um, I've listed here the, the different types of facilities that we're explicitly uh, addressing, and you'll notice that it, it covers a, a pretty wide range from residential to non-residential to healthcare, and also uh, transportation. So it's intended to be adaptable uh, at some level to any uh, system type, and, and one reason for not being uh, climate zone specific is that ASHRAE has members in, in more than 130 countries, 20% outside of North America, and the U.S. itself includes eight of the nine uh, climate zones as we typically define them. So in, in terms of the types of systems addressed, I thought it might be useful to um, show you the, the sorts of things we're familiar with seeing uh, in, in uh, North America where most of ASHRAE's members are. The, the typical residential system is a, a forced air system, um, constant volume um, with a lot of recirculation, um, typically heating and cooling done by uh, a furnace, maybe a gas furnace uh, with a D DX uh, air conditioner <clears throat> or possibly a heat pump. And in older homes, like the one I'm sitting in uh, right now, there's no uh, mechanical ventilation. So we depend on, on natural ventilation, opening of windows and doors in most of our homes to bring in outdoor air. Uh, although newer homes are starting to have energy recovery uh, ventilator uh, outdoor air supplies. And that's indicated uh, in, in the figure on the right as uh, an optional feature, a, a advisable one, but not one that we find in most homes. Uh, for uh, non-residential systems, what we might find in, in an office building or a, an academic building is on my university campus. Uh, a lot of other facilities, we have many uh, multiple space, uh, all air systems, particularly variable air volume. And I've, I've shown a, uh, an illustration of one of those on the right-hand side. So uh, we have a supply air flow rate that's determined by choices about room conditions and supply air conditions. And uh, we bring in outdoor air according to, uh, to code and, and mix it with that. And we may wind up with uh, uh, as little as 20% as or less of the supply air being uh, outdoor air and the rest is recirculated. These systems typically, to save energy, have uh, all air uh, economizers that can go up to 100% outdoor air, but that's assumed to happen only during times when there's um, uh, outdoor conditions that are compatible with reducing the cooling load. And so the maximum ventilation rate that one could bring in while um, not affecting indoor conditions adversely is dependent on the weather. Uh, the filters in these systems are generally in the air handling unit. So uh, to remove indoor contaminants, they have to have recirculation through them, otherwise they don't do anything. And so the more we increase the outdoor air, the less recirculation we get through the filters, and there's a trade-off between 
removal of indoor generated contaminants by ventilation and uh, removal by filters, which is quite significant if you look at the overall impact. The other type of system that we're seeing a lot of is a, a dual path or dedicated outdoor air system where we have a 100% once through outdoor air supply that's sized for the ventilation requirement according to standard. And then we have some type of parallel uh, zonal system in the space, fan coil units or radiant panels or chilled beams or something of, um, of that sort. So these systems have little or no ability to increase their outdoor airflow rate. Uh, and they often serve spaces that, that don't have operable windows. So there, there's an issue here with the doing anything that would uh, involve uh, trying to actually raise the outdoor air flow rate. And uh, the other thing about these systems that's important to recognize is that any filter in the ventilation airstream isn't doing anything for indoor contaminants. So if we're going to do particle filtration, it has to be done some other way. So those are some of the, the basic conditions that these uh, principles address. Uh, ASHRAE, I guess like Riva, has an as yet unpublished set of, of core uh, principles that are the, the basis for the detailed guidance that ASHRAE has published. And uh, I've picked out only ones that relate specifically to ventilation here. The others are uh, important, but not uh, so relevant to today's topic. And I'll, uh, I'll say more about some of these and, and some I'll just um, leave with what's stated here. Uh, the, the first is that we should provide at least the, the minimum outdoor airflow that's required by standard when the building is occupied. So at least compliant with ASHRAE standard 62.1 or, or uh, comparable. Uh, secondly, that uh, filters should perform up to the level of MERV 13, which is a little less than what uh, Yarek was talking about uh, in terms of a, uh, an ISO filter specification. Uh, this should be done for all recirculated airstreams if possible. Uh, we also address the issue of flushing of, of buildings and uh, on the basis of uh, the theory of well-mixed spaces, three air changes um, of air, uh, whatever time it takes to do that is what it would take to clear between occupancy periods. Uh, we are expressing a mild preference for mixing ventilation, and I'll, I'll uh, expand on that. Uh, again, like uh, Riva, strong air currents are, uh, are something that we uh, recommend avoiding because they can uh, increase uh, direct contact by, by droplet spray, uh, extending uh, that mode of, of transmission. And, and the final uh, piece of guidance is to combine different control measures, outdoor air filters and air cleaners, uh, to reach the desired level of exposure control while minimizing energy penalties. Uh, why is that important? Uh, it's important because when you actually talk to people who are operating buildings and who are responsible for putting in measures, they're very focused on how much energy is in, uses impacted and what costs are, and they may not do things you recommend if they feel that that's really uh, infeasible uh, on, on either count. So it's just a, a pragmatism to do that, but we think it's also the right approach to try to include other uh, constraints in our, our thinking here. So. I formulated a few uh, questions to myself about why we do some of these things, and, and uh, this will explain some of the rationale for the, the recommendations I just went through. Uh, why minimum required uh, outdoor air instead of as much as possible? Um, certainly minimum outdoor air by itself isn't uh, sufficient. We're not saying that, but uh, saying as much as possible results in very inconsistent uh, outcomes across the types of systems that we've recommended, and it has uh, adverse consequences that go along with it. So a, a DOAS system, you can't uh, increase the outdoor air. You're stuck with what you have. And for VAB systems, uh, you may get a large risk reduction, but also that comes with a large energy use increase, potential operational problems, and as I noted, it uh, trades off with filter effectiveness. So uh, uh, it's not the most effective way to get to where we'd like to be. And and so our uh, position is that minimum outdoor air with upgraded filters and, and possibly other uh, modes of control can achieve similar outcomes to lots of ventilation 
uh, and at lower energy use and, and cost. <clears throat> Another question, uh, why MERV 13 filters and not HEPA? Uh, the first is a practical one. If we're looking at our recirculating systems, they may be upgradable to MERV 13, but they're certainly not upgradable to HEPA, and that's an expensive direction to go. Um, a second point is that uh, the lack of evidence of room-to-room -room transmission suggests that we do not have to capture all uh, infectious aerosol on a, a single pass. Um, removal rate based on, on the recirculation rate combined with the filter efficiency seems to be the most important thing. And uh, some may have seen this uh, study by Azimi and Stevens that looked at influenza risk. And they found uh, that going to about MERV-13 seemed to be the, uh, the optimal point in terms of filter efficiency in a typical system like we might see in North America. And that also resulted in uh, much lower energy use and cost impact than increasing ventilation to achieve the same outcome. Uh, why not be concerned about recirculation? Um, well, we, we are concerned, but only where it really matters. So if we have uh, spaces with poor ventilation, uh, recirculation can cause problems. And uh, as was noted in uh, Derek's presentation, uh, energy recovery wheels uh, have issues with recirculation that should be checked, and ASHRAE has guidance on that as, as well. Um, within systems, we don't think that it's critical because, again, the evidence is that there hasn't been a lot of, or any even, uh, transmission space to space, and uh, there is this trade-off between uh, recirculation reduction and filtration effectiveness that's already been noted. And, and finally, I would note that uh, the approach to healthcare ventilation that is taken uh, in, in North America is generally high air change rates recirculating through uh, pretty good or very good filters. Uh, ASHRAE standard 170 is referenced by uh, most states and, and by some other uh, countries as a standard for uh, infection control ventilation in healthcare facilities. As you can see from these two examples that I've pulled out of it, a patient room requires two uh, air changes of outdoor air minimum and uh, total supply air minimum of four air changes with a MERV-7 pre-filter and MERV-14 final filter. And it's not required that uh, the, the room air be exhausted to the outdoors. Uh, this is starting to look a lot like what the, the re recommendations are that we've been making for COVID-19 protection in non-healthcare buildings. Uh, a more uh, uh, sensitive environment is a protective environment, and there it's two air changes with 12 recirculation air changes and uh, a HEPA final filter. So. At the, uh, the high end, uh, we go to a, a lot of protection, but again, it's provided not by more outdoor air, but by more recirculation and higher efficiency filters. Uh, ASHRAE believes that air cleaners can be useful, but there are a lot of reasons to be very careful uh, about applying them as supplements to uh, outdoor air and, and uh, mechanical filtration. Uh, there are technologies that can be applied in individual spaces and also Centrally, the, the ones that uh, we focus on are standalone HEPA filter units, uh, which, which can uh, efficiently produce clean air streams in rooms, and uh, germicidal ultraviolet. Uh, upper room is certainly the most effective, but air handler installations can be helpful in some cases as well, for example, when it's not possible to upgrade filters very much because of system limitations. So the figure on the, the right in this slide is taken from some well, work by uh, uh, Harvard School of Public Health, and it reports equivalent air changes for upper room systems for a number of different pathogens. And uh, you, you notice that the, uh, there are many cases where you can have the equivalent of more than 10 air changes per hour of outdoor air from uh, an effectively functioning upper room system. So uh, that's why these are uh, looked at as being a good option, although they're fairly expensive. There are many other technologies a lot of them produce reactive species, and we have a lot of concerns about that, so we aren't really endorsing them. And uh, uh, we, we take a, a buyer beware approach to those. The, the evidence needs to be considered carefully for a specific product that you might want to apply, both efficacy and safety. Uh, 
why mixing when uh, we know that stratification is better for air quality? Uh, well, there actually have been some studies by uh, uh, Europeans. Uh, Peter Nielsen has been involved in these, Matt Sandberg, and uh, looking at uh, risk in healthcare environments, they found that uh, the exhalations of infected persons can get trapped in uh, inversion layers in stratified systems. So there may actually be a protective effect to distributing infectious material uh, more uniformly with mixing. But this is kind of a soft recommendation. It needs more study. You can see a visualization from some of uh, Lee's work there that shows exactly what uh, I'm talking about. In, in the last recommendation, um, I mentioned the desired level of exposure control. What does, exactly does that mean? Uh, this relates to a similar approach to what uh, Yarek was describing. There's a growing acceptance of, uh, of a, uh, an equivalent clean air supply or equivalent air change rate as a way of, of managing risk. This is typically done with uh, Wells-Riley model analysis, which of course only addresses the, the airborne transmission and assumes a lot of things, but it's about the best tool we have right now. Although, you know, Yarek showed some uh, uh, quanta production rates from uh, the uh, Bonanno et al. Uh, article. The thing to point out about that is that around those means are, are two orders of magnitude of, uh, of difference between the fifth percentile and the 95th. Uh, but this is still a good approach and it allows optimization to realize the subjective of, of not being um, excessively costly or energy intensive in developing good um, combinations of, of measures to control risk. Uh, and the, the results of doing this, as I've uh, suggested uh, briefly before, are somewhat comparable to what we see in our uh, longstanding healthcare ventilation standards, which I, I think is uh, kind of reassuring. So to summarize, uh, the, the ASHRAE recommendations currently are providing a, a baseline uh, that can be built on and uh, that may be necessary to enhance based on whatever our uh, risk reduction target is. Uh, the emphasis is increasingly on feasibility of implementation and uh, to some extent impact on energy use, uh, allowing multiple controls to be used and to be combined in ways that are appropriate for a particular application seems to be the best thing to do, and it also uh, places responsibility where it ultimately needs to be, which is on the, uh, the professionals uh, doing the controls for a specific environment. High-level guidance has its limitations. Uh, and, and the final point I would make in summary is that while we endorse this approach of uh, equivalent air exchange rates, I think we need a better understanding of, uh, uh, of those so we can do it with uh, more confidence than perhaps we have right now. And so that completes my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you.